Welcome to Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan, a podcast about the art and hobby of miniature painting. I'm Mike. Thank you so much for joining us on our continued quest to become better, braver, happier painters. I am coming to you from Denton, Texas, and I have been enjoying ReaperCon. I know we had talked about uh, doing a bunch of content during ReaperCon, and it starts today. The reason why we haven't put anything else out is because I wanted to make sure I got my entries in for the painting contest and... Uh, I will post pictures of those on uh, the, either later tonight or tomorrow because I do not like to put pictures out uh, while the competition's going on and hasn't been judged. Uh, that's just kind of my own personal preference. You do as you wish. It's your miniature, but for me, it's just one of those uh, mojo things that I try not to jinx myself uh, by putting stuff out there. Now, with that being said, I have interviews set up with a bunch of artists today that I'm going to try to put out as soon as possible, and we are bringing you today an interview with Ed and Dave Pugh, the owners of Reaper Miniatures, which is so super exciting. Uh, it was a great interview. I got to take the tour of the facility beforehand, and then we talked for about 40 minutes, uh, and it was really it was a great time uh, getting to know them and uh, getting to know about the Reaper business, etc., and the uh, family feeling that it seems that all the Reaper employees have working, which is totally awesome. So besides that, on Thursday, I was able to take a class with Michael Proctor on glazing and propping, uh, uh, popping your colors. Uh, please check out his work at Clever Crow Studios. Michael has been a, a great friend of the show, and the class was fantastic. I learned a lot, um, and also thinking about... Uh, not thinking about colors and just putting colors on something was kind of cool. It's hard to explain, but uh, it was certainly a, a lot of fun. Um, I was also took the tour, like I said, and I've been working uh, nonstop. And I'll also do a picture review of all the goodies that I've picked up here. And let me just tell you, this is a place where uh, your wallet empties quickly because there is a lot of awesome vendors and there are a lot of awesome vendors etc and i got to meet up with john mcavoy of mini masterworks who's been on the show a couple of times so that's pretty cool too uh so but without further ado let's get this content rolling and i am proud and uh very excited to present an interview with ed and dave pew of reaper miniatures thank you so much and welcome to the show we're glad to have you here glad to be here this is fun Oh, you know, it, it, this is, uh, I'm beside myself, the, having the chance to be here at ReaperCon has just been an incredible thing, and you know, thank, I, wanted to, I wanted to say thank you to begin with for the tour, because that was amazing. Oh, good, good, I'm glad you liked that part, that's You, you know, I learned so much, it's an interesting aspect of the business, actually, it's funny, it's like, you were asking, you know, oh, anybody got any questions, and I'm like, I have so many questions, I don't even know where to begin asking them, and I was like, originally this morning, I was freaked out, I'm like, I only got like four or five questions to ask him, um, because I was, brain was painting, but, uh, so if you wouldn't mind, uh, for our listeners, uh, give just a little bit of your hobby background, I know that on the Reaper Live, you've kind of covered that, oh, yeah. origin okay. story, uh, I've always been, I've always, from as a kid, I'm hobby oriented. I'm very heavily hobby oriented. Anyway, I started, uh, the first stuff I ever painted was kids. I used to paint, I had those uh, Marks play sets, like you open up the suitcase. Up, and I, paid, I had to paint my guys to play with them, you know, that kind of stuff. But anyway, I started, uh, I was in college in Denton and started painting miniatures there. A friend of mine had worked at Heritage, and uh, so he had been a caster there. And so all of a sudden one night, he had been by my apartment, he saw models, he saw this, all this junk I'd done. And he goes, oh, I got something to show you. And he brought that over, and I was just, you know, and all I had at the time were just either oils or tester paint, just garbage. But uh, nonetheless, that's where I started, and that would have been, I guess, in the early 80s, somewhere in there, and then just just like a fish to water. But the thing I got out of it the most was is that I could, uh, and this is part of joy, it was like a mind reset on Saturday morning. You know, you can go to the store, get some stuff, you're back, you're painting by 11 or noon, and then all of a sudden you're yawning, you go, damn, I'm hungry, look around, it's like one in the morning. Yeah, you know, pop, just snap the finger, and that much time's gone. So that's amazing. So, well, what brought you? So, um, then, what created Reaper then? Because you know, I, I understand you have an accounting background. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, to go from accounting to a miniature company, it's sort of a yeah, yes, <laughs> a, a, a hard connection. No, it was twofold. There were two issues going on at the time, or two things. First off, my brother and I were playing in bands, and we always had hobbies pay for hobbies, and so moving equipment, all this shit. You're, you're all the time breaking stuff and junk. So, and this was all my hobby was painting. So I knew something about it. And then we're at, at the accounting office. It's a weird, it, the industry to sell, it's, uh, it's very restrictive. They don't allow any puffing. You can't advertise and say, hey, I'm the best accountant in the world. You know, they, they're very conservative. 
And so what we were finding was, I was finding is, is that I would offer advice to somebody. Say, hey, this is okay, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Or if you did X, Y, and Z, A, B, C would happen. And that could solve your problem. And I was found they weren't doing it. And they didn't understand it. Or can you show me more and stuff. And so it dawned on us that we could, uh, uh, if we started a small company, then there's no privacy. I can show you over here we did X, Y, Z. And here's A, B, C, and here's these records. I couldn't do that with your tax return or your public, you know, your information. So that sort of helped guide it. And we knew we wanted to manufacture something. Uh, I was not a big service industry kind of idea. So that was part of it. And really the only thing I really knew the most about anything by manufacturing was figurines. So uh, we just started there. And how it started was a company called uh, Distinguished Flying Collectibles. And I had uh, one 432nd scale models from, uh, and this is my brother, he's come on in. Uh, <laughs> As, uh, and, and I would paint them up in their liveries from World War II or whatever and uh, take them to gun shows. We'd take them to gun shows. And they'd sell. It did real well. And uh, so that sort of led from one thing to the next. And we kicked off uh, Reaper at, at the time. That would have been 4th of July, 1992. Uh, and uh, we had watched... The name came from... Uh, we had watched... Bill and Ted's bogus adventure okay. and the Grim Reaper character in that movie we just laughed that whole weekend and so we were trying to come up with names and of course you're trying to come up with serious names or whatever and you're like look this is just sort of a throwaway idea we're going down this road and so we just said the Reaper and so that's how it started in that as you saw that picture was that house in that half a car garage mm -hmm. is where we were and we were just like two kids we got a spin caster so we're just like two kids in a garage with a spin caster now what do we do we don't know anything about manufacturing so I learned how to make molds over the phone with a guy, and when it came time to open the box, I called back, and well, he was now at the movie for the next two hours. So it was just, we were like, oh, get a grenade, I don't know, use a flamethrower, I don't know what, you were get this, you know. And we finally got, got it down pat, and we did there, and it just kept going. And the first product that hit hard was Scry Counters. Magic had just come out, mm -hmm. and I was real early in on Magic, and put all my sets together, the Alpha Beta, all that garbage, and uh, because it was a good, we're traveling, we're hitting these shows, and this is a good card game to play while we're sitting in a van for 20 hours or something we're going to Gen Con and so we made these scry counters and the next thing you know we go to Gen Con and come back with an order for like 60,000 of them oh my and goodness. so yeah, I just went to my dad and said well guess what I gotta give my two weeks notice you know because the, the accounting from the CPA part was my dad my brother and, my, and myself and we had consolidated down into this office in Louisville we had offices in Wichita Falls and out in West Texas small town out in West Texas as well satellite offices so we brought it all down here, and so we're operating out of that. And so I'm just sort of like, you know, you, you, I don't get a chance like this often, so let's go try it. And, uh, and in this industry, you know, I can, I can, I'm free to go ahead and say, hey, we do make the best miniatures in the world. You know, it's not a conservative industry. <laughs> yeah, and right. so that's sort of how it all got started. It's just a lot of different things coming together, and all pulled it together. So. Well, I remember when lawyers used to not be able to advertise at all. It was a, it was yeah. a violation of the bar. bar yes. Uh, yeah, to advertise. So it's interesting. I didn't realize that there were the same uh, constraints on. CPAs. And it's still to this day, very much so. We still, I still, we, I do maintain my license. So is my brother, and uh, so we still take our forty hours of CPE every year. And you have to have an ethics class every two years. So that's, uh, I guess, somebody figured out it takes you two years to become unethical, and so you would uh, take that. But yeah, it's a lot of that. What you can say and what you can't do. And, See, I work for the federal government, so I have to take it twice a year. No, twice a year, yeah, really. <laughs> I have to take an ethics training twice a year. <coughs> yeah. You know, the, the, pri the priority and stuff along those lines. So, yeah. um, it, it, Dave, feel free if you want to chime in at all with any of this, too. That's okay. I'm not... It's just, it's just it's a podcast as he's doing. We don't... We have... The only rules that we have is that the people that we talk to are comfortable. That's it. And we yeah. have fun talking to anybody that wants to talk about... I wouldn't dream of... Horning in on Ed's interview. Yeah, yeah. No, he's my constant. I'm real liberal with numbers. Like you could come to me and say, okay, how many, how many, how many acorns are in that bowl? And I would count them, and I'd say it's 33. And I go, oh no, there's about 40. Okay, that's my world, right? And Dave's world is uh, just quite the opposite. You know, I'll go, well, that's probably you know $400. And Dave goes, it's $278.91. So that's sort of the the difference between the two of us. So. Well, it's a good balance. It's a good balance. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So what was the first actual then miniature that you produced? The first, well, the airplanes. But if we got out of that, that side of it and we started into fantasy, uh, I had purchased some uh, figure lines through the years. There was a Warlord figure line a long mm -hmm. time ago. 
Al, one of our original partners, had he had he had purchased uh, some of the heritage lines out of bankruptcy from Heritage Miniatures, oh, wow. and so between those two, we formed our first line. They were the 1400s, and we were just out selling that. And the whole reason we decided we we originally formed a Deco, which is the name of that company, just to do the contract casting, and we were doing uh, UIL medals and just every kind of trophy thing you could imagine for all these trophy houses. And it's, it was fun, it kept the factory going, but you didn't really care about what you're producing. You just knew it's it's right. like we're over here making cotton balls or something. So you just had to keep doing it. And the, the thing was, is it was a very cutthroat industry too. I mean, it didn't matter, I could do your work for three or four years, and then somebody come along and say, I can do it for half a cent cheaper. Pop, you're over to him. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were doing that. And so that's when the, the big disruption to the industry, that's when Pewter stepped in, or when the, the price, price, when everybody's trying to get away from lead to lead free. Right. And the figure prices shot way up because these lead free formulas were so much more expensive. Lead, the original lead formulas were 95% lead, 5% bismuth. And so they were costing 25, 30 cents a pound. And all of a sudden now they're paying, you know, about 50 a pound or whatever they were paying. So they had rallidium and all this stuff. And it just really was just like a, a, a snap through the industry. So for us, that I realized, I look at those situations is opportunity. One of the things I'd realized was, is anything that serves chaos, then that's the time if you're going to get in there, that's the time. Because you know no bad times. And they're having to now deal with these bad times. So, <coughs> excuse me, that was why we, that's when we said we'd do the fantasy. So we resurrected these lines, we cast them in a lead. Actually, we used a lot of tin in ours, but still uh, about 40% tin. But still, they were good figures and they were still popular. And mm -hmm. so that's how we got started. But no one was going to ever took us seriously because you're just doing the old heritage stuff, you know, right. that kind of joke. So the first real figures came along when we did Dark Heaven, and I want to say that was, what would you say, Dave, 94? Dark Heaven was uh, 2000, no, yeah, 90, 94. In that area, 93, yeah. right after. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and really how that started was is we did our business meetings once a week. Dave and I and I would go to this restaurant called Poncho's. It's a Mexican buffet kind of place. Every Tuesday night, that's where we go. And so I'm, one night we're sitting there and I'm going, hey guys, I got all these figures left over from the scry countertops and, and stuff like that. And they're good stuff. You know, Julie Guthrie had done it, Sandra Garrity and this. And I got all this other junk. You want me to just dump them in the heritage line or you want me to create something new? And everybody's like, ah, oh, we don't care. Just do whatever. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm not going to waste it. So we started Dark Heaven at that point. And the first release was like 18, 18 pieces. And that was our first ones that were all our original stuff and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, and then I immediately, we went on that wave, I went to the Gamma Show in New Orleans. It was our first trade show, company mm -hmm. business business trade show. And at that show, now being an accountant, you know, to tell the truth, you know, it's a lot easier to go through life that way. So I'm sitting here telling these stories. I go, well, this is a 28 millimeter model, you know, because that was what we were doing. And now that's when I realized stores really, they're there to buy stuff to sell and they don't like disruption. So what was happening to all of them, this is before lunch or in the morning, is they go, I don't want a new scale in my store. Well, it, it's not. It's not a new scale. It's just an honest representation of what we're doing. Do you sell GW? Yeah. Well, theirs is 28, okay? But right. they didn't market it that way. Mm -hmm. They said they're 25, okay? So like I go to lunch. Huh? Like the blisters would be different size. Yeah, or so, yeah exactly. So I, I, I go to lunch, and I'm there with a Jack Van Shake from Rotham, and I'm telling him my problem. And he says, well, just welcome to the world of you know, manufacturing, and you've got to figure your way out of this. And uh, so I kept thinking about it because I want to be truthful, right? And I don't want to, you know. So I went back and what I did is I came up with this phrase, heroic scale. And so what I would tell these stores on the after lunch, they, the guy, they, these, because there's throngs of stores and stuff, and they come by and I go, oh, yeah, it's 25 millimeter heroic scale. Oh, that sounds cool. And so they would come in and then all of a sudden we're writing orders, right. you know. <clears throat> and then a heroic scale became into a whole, I mean, it's just now everywhere. I mean, the, the, and, and how people use the term. It's just amazing, I'll watch that. It has really nothing to do from the origins of it, which was you know, how we were doing it at the time. But nonetheless, that was sort of our first baptism with our new figures. And um, distribution at the time was like, why are you coming out with models? It model miniatures are dead, because at that time it was all now getting to magic. And uh, mm -hmm. that was another, like a second torpedo to the rest of the industry. And uh, so you would sit down and see all these companies just dying because magic was sucking up all the dollars. For us, it didn't, so we just kept growing and uh, got to there. So that's sort of our first ones and then what happened and how we sort of rolled into what we were doing. Well, it seems interesting at the time when Magic kind of came out and there was a sister game, Jihad, which was then became yeah. Vampire the Awakening and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. It does seem like 
Yeah, I noticed that there was kind of that death of the the independent miniature company and such along oh, yeah. those lines. And um, one of the things I think the the probably the point of entry was easier for Magic that you go buy a, a starter deck and then you could play. Go in it, yes. You know, games like you know. Uh, the Games Workshop, the, the entry point for a Games Workshop game is enormous. You throw mm-hmm. 100 to 200 bucks easily. To get started the, up. Just yes. to get started up. Um, one of the things that I've noticed and had conversations with people that live around me, because there's a little gaming group that are trying to get kids, is they actually told me to relay the message to you guys that they really appreciate the price point of, of the, those miniatures yeah. because it allows them to bring kids in into the equation into the group yeah. and now they you know they've started i've actually donated a bunch of my bones for to the kids group so that they can start painting and then we're going to start doing painting classes and stuff like that at a local yeah. store so we there you have a definitely a big fan base at Bur- in burke virginia you know yeah. we appreciate y'all no that's been a guiding force behind a lot of trying to keep the price down um and trying to find alternative ways to do it uh mm-hmm. and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but right. uh but definitely we did that. But Magic was, uh, what it turned, it, it literally, because I, I discovered Magic, I was sitting at a show in Houston, and my, our booth was dead, because this Magic had come along. But, you know, I'm having fun, I know the people. It's all still new, right? So you're just running, running around the circus. And there's this lady I knew real well, she's across from me, and these people keep coming up and buying this box. And then they go over to an empty table, and they create this huge pile of trash, opening up all this stuff. And they get away, they throw away all the trash, and they go buy another box and rinse and repeat. And so I'm like, I don't know what this is, but it looks like it'd be fun. So I go over there, and she hooks me with it. And, and it's, it, 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 those days, it was like crack. And uh, uh, so, you know, I bought all this magic and did all this stuff and, and then got into it. But at the same time, what you saw is all the retail stores. And I saw this because I was traveling around trying to get the rare ones or the odd prints, misprints, these kind of things, is that all of the stores, stores I'd gone into for years, were now empty. They were just magic stores. And what it was for them was like, I've got a $1 bill, and if I put it in this machine, a $5 bill comes out. So honey, go to the store, give me a bunch of $1 bills, and that's all we're doing. And so all these stores, their shelves were empty. I would travel, I'd be in San Antonio, it didn't matter where I was going. The stores were just, they had turned into magic houses. And it was all great for everybody until, I don't remember the edition, red, it was red, it was the red edition, that's what I call it. You know, went to Arabian Nights and all the dark and all these uh, these releases, and that red edition just cracked. I think it was Imphal and Empire. I don't remember what it's called, but mm-hmm. anyway, pow! It was just like a metric, just dead. And then, but everybody had written off miniatures and role playing games. You could not distribution. Just thought, my God, that's just a pariah. Why don't you guys just please go away? You know, stores don't want it. <laughs> just walk off. <laughs> just walk off. Quit bothering us. <laughs> if I give you a dollar, will you just leave me alone? And uh, and that's the way they were. And then they realized that that that. Heaven's not going to be here forever, I guess, or something. So they, they had to go back. But then also, too, it caused a lot of those companies to have to rethink what they were doing. You know, Ralph Partha started to, to really work towards working with the RPG companies. They had the they D&D license for years, but they started doing the, the three-fold character packs or the three-tier, and just all sorts of stuff. Right. And they moved heavily into collectibles or the collectible market. There used to be a huge market of this polished pewter with gems like you'd see in the tobacco stores and stuff. Ralph Partha was huge into that. So that was a whole revenue stream over here that got them through hard times and stuff. And then people started, they, and back then though, gamers were a gamer, like you played magic and nothing else. Or you did miniatures. Right. Or you were into the live reactions like the, the masquerade or something. And nowadays, you know, you do it all. You're, you're a computer, you're a miniature painter, you're a RPG, it doesn't, and that helps a lot. But back then, yeah, it, it just all but wiped them out. And, uh, so we just well, we, we we survive. So it sounds like an evolutionary <coughs> process that like you kind of watch the way the market goes and such because yeah. you can buy Magic the Gathering miniature games now, too, right? Which yes. is kind of a funny yeah. side of it. Um, so I'm curious because one of the big areas of the podcast, you know, listening to Paint Dry, um, I've noticed now that we're starting to see bus for mm-hmm. Reaper um, and. The U.S. market seems to be changing a little, probably not on the scale that I would love it to because of my, my lack of gaming, um, but like the European market is a huge area for painting figures. Painting for painting. Yeah, yeah. painting for painting's sake. Uh, and then now I see Reaper's kind of going somewhat more in that direction with yeah. the bus, et cetera. Do you see Reaper evolving more that way or... 
like you see more busts or maybe even uh, larger figures coming out, not necessarily large monsters, but maybe 75 millimeter scale or 50. We've done, we've dabbled in that area off and on with it. I do think it'll become more, more centric as we go. Uh, it's, but it's a lower volume market that we're used to. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Andrea makes some amazing stuff, but the volume they'll sell over the life of a piece or even on a new release is very small. And that's sort of what hurts it is you've got that going in you know, costs and stuff like that. We'll get there. Europeans are much more accepting of it because they don't see, the U.S. had sort of a schism, and that was that, that we had all these historical painters for years doing IPMS, and then now I'm doing busts and this, you know. And uh, somewhere down the line, well, I know what it is, is on the, the, the cost of the figurines for them took them down a path of scratch building. And then for us, we stayed in the 40s, and so we developed painting to an art form that they don't get. And so the two camps separated. And whereas in Europe, man, they paint historical, they paint fantasy, they paint whatever, science fiction. Yeah. A painter is a painter. And over here, you do see, I'm a fantasy painter still, you know, or I'll do some sci-fi, a little bit, or steampunk, you know, but then the historical people, yeah, I paint all historical, but yeah, maybe I'll go over here and do a fantasy piece, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you don't have that between the two markets. So it makes it harder to get the volume needed to be able to, to be able to hit that and stay in that arena. Plus, to the competition, I'll be honest with you, it's dead. It's hard on serious. Between Pegaso and Andrea, it's hard. I always like to look at areas and go, what can we do in that area that hasn't already been done? And boy, you get into the bust and all of the large stuff, and boy, that's, man, it, that's some good stuff. Yeah. And you see, like, even down the road in Dallas, scale 75, you know, they uh -huh. that, yeah. that as well. <coughs> yeah. You know, um, and it's interesting because it's kind of like the schism between acrylic and oil painters, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know the yeah. historical <laughs> yeah. the oils and stuff along those lines. I'm a member of a group called the National Capital Model Soldier Society, uh -huh. and I'm one of like two fantasy people or inside of that. Right. And then there's like 40 history and a couple of Gundam people, and then it's like, yeah, you can see the they're starting to become more accepting of what. Well, see, and there's an intimidation of. I would one time I was talking to some painters here, <clears throat> and they would and they would say things like, "Well, no." I, I, I think it'd be fun to paint historicals, but I'm just scared I'd put the wrong color on. I don't want them coming up and go, well, that's the wrong blue. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, well, it's, not, it's not really like that. It can be, I guess, for some people. But, you know, it's, it's like when I was teaching, like to paint historicals, you got to remember, this is made by the lowest bidder. You know, I saw a collection somewhere one time, I think it was Doug Cohen had it, uh, of olive drab marine uniform test patches or something that were over from like 1940 through 46 or something. There wasn't two that were even remotely close. <clears throat> so the marine uniform dramatically changed from browns to light greens to dark. And it wasn't like, oh, this is for this theater. No, this is just the standard marine uniform for those years. Right. But now there's an accepted 1943 olive draft or something like that. <clears throat> and that's sort of it. And it's not so much they're great painters, but they don't want to look at a picture and recreate the picture. They want to go create. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the element that's missing. Where if you went and paid a, a, a you know a Napoleonic Grenadier and said, well, I think I'm gonna put him in pink, and I'm gonna add this, and I'm gonna feather in that, and I think I'm gonna scratch build some 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 wings for it, you know, I mean that would be blasphemy to those guys, right? You know, you know it's funny too because they they look at that stuff and then they talk about like uh, young miniatures, how historical accurate. And I'm like, you realize that the guy that paints all of those busts for young miniatures, Kirill Kaninov. He's a fantasy painter to begin with. To begin with, yeah. Right, like, like let me show you his <coughs> yeah. fantasy stuff. Like, he can do, do it all, you know, so it kind of bridges, it bridges that. But that's where Dave and I started. Really, we got very heavy in the ministry. We did micro armor. We did aircraft. We did Napoleonics out to Wazini. Yeah. I cannot tell you how fact, much we did that. That was the last that. time I painted. was 1992. It was Napoleonics. He had a wow. Westphalian core he was finishing up. And uh, uh, we just played and did that. And just that was where we originally came from, I guess. But... The fantasy for me was always there because I was always big Sennhauser fan. You know, just you know, just go, you know, right. paint the fantasy. The, I want to see the skeletons. I want to see this, you know. But yeah, that was it's it is it's just. But over there, it really is just one world, and uh, they don't care if you paid for gaming. That's fine. If this is what I got to paint. I'll paint it. I'll make it look like that. But right. that's not. I'm not worried about it. You know, I'm also going to do this and that. So right. If you want me, I'm going to put a 2D background on it. And do, yeah. Like, like yeah. Do all yeah. these other great, customer wants. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. In a way. Yeah. Exactly, but I, I mean, Napoleonics is the last thing you painted. I look in your office and see a giant Darth Vader. How can you not paint like sci fi stuff? <laughs> I just, uh, no, I, uh, Napoleonics burned me out on it. Did it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just never could get back into painting after that. And anyway, after that, we, 
we started getting into music. We were in a band. Doing uh, that for us until we had two years. Boys. Yeah. And so I spent all my time learning and yeah. practicing and doing all that. Didn't have time for painting. We so did. We, and we did, like, we did that night with uh, 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 Wolfman Jack. There's a picture on his desk. A day oh, playing yeah. bass and me on drums and uh, Wolfman Jack. And and <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like Dave and I like to say. It's before we hit our fatty years, and uh, kind of a thing. So, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, that was for us. And then Reaper along the way. With, but also, too, people ask, why did you do Napoleonic now? As well, they're just not again the volume, the mm -hmm. money. And then I don't know what right. we could do that isn't already being done much better right. than what we would do. You know, but here, there's this old picture. Doesn't look like Dave now or me, but yeah, <laughs> I had hair. Believe me, I understand those too. Yeah. I, I'm there too, you know. <laughs> when you want to feel old, they, uh, one of the employees that works in paint was in there. He says, oh, it's a picture. Oh, and that's you. Wow, you're young. Who's that? Yeah. Oh, it's Wolfman Jack. How <coughs> do you not know Wolfman Jack? <laughs> yeah. I was talking with uh, Eric Swenson, one of the artists here, and I cut another couple people, and they're all, all, I grew up in Southern Virginia, um, and they are down there now. And uh, they were talking about when the first time we let the Southern Virginia went to having uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th high school, it used to be uh, 7, 8, 9 was middle school. But my, oh. my senior year in high school was when the first time we had freshmen. And that was in 1991. And um, Eric's like, I was six. And turns to the other guy and goes, it was still four years before you were born. And I'm like, oh, my God, God I feel yes, so yeah. old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, but I, I know you guys got to get back to. So we know, yeah. Keep yeah. What else you got? No, no. That, that, it's, this has been fantastic. Um, I know you want to get back to the to, to the con. So uh, just a couple other quick questions. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, is always interesting to me is how you uh, bring in artists and sculptors and stuff along those lines. Mm -hmm. What is that kind of? Is there? A, are you guys on the lookout, or do artists approach you? Or it started off; they were all buried back when I used to do Ron Shop when we first started, mm -hmm. and that was what I was doing. Ron was in production, and uh, uh, they were all buried at that time. So mm -hmm. with Ralph Partha, they would have Jay Guthrie is uh, the artist on the card, right? But and so everybody thought that was John Guthrie or S. Garrity, Sam Garrity, and that was Sandra Garrity, you know. Right. So, but everybody was buried, and it took a while going to the shows. Initially, I had a couple of sculptors. I did sculpting, just not that I'm a sculptor, but out of necessity, we need figures. So I made skeletons, I did this. Yeah. Are, do, are there yeah. skele those around somewhere to see, or? Oh yeah, they're still around. No, that, that one of the original, that, that skeleton archer that's in the Learn to Paint kit, it's in the Bones line, it's mm -hmm. in, that's one of the ones I painted for the very first release. Oh, you know? very nice. So. Uh, but, you know, we didn't really have anybody, but as I was hitting the shows, well, then I started meeting these people, you know, face to face. I'd meet Julie, and we would be at a breakfast, and somebody would introduce me, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was easy then to approach them. they go, oh, yeah, we do, you know, uh, uh, but see, this is before the internet, so there was no way to, I couldn't call Rob Parth up and say, can I speak to John Garrity, or whoever that person is, I want to use him. Oh, they'd shut that down real fast, you right. know. And the same, Games Workshop the same way in the early days. And so we would find them that way. Oh, then, they're still like that. <laughs> yeah, so still like they're that. still very much like that. Uh, but anyway, but you, you saw know, them as more as a marketing tool. Yeah. So I saw. And so what happened was, is I said, I, well, I finally talked to Sandra and, I, and Bob Adolfi, and I said, guys, look, here's what I'll do. We run an ad every month, and, this, and I'll just alternate between you and the, the, the Dragon Magazine, and so it'll be a full page ad. And this is all Sandra Garrity figures, and this is all Bob Adolfi, and really just started pushing names out there, That's awesome. and that that got that that. That got an awareness, but it also gave access to them. They knew who to look for. They knew it was what it was, and that they were approachable. And so that was really because they're all freelance. So I'm not gonna. I'll do anything I can do for them to get as much as they can. This wasn't a studio, and uh, so that's how it was then. Then we get to the internet, and the internet worked well if you were part of the internet. But you had all the a lot of these sculptors were old or older, mm -hmm. and they had nothing to do with the internet. So you know you still had to go to shows and things like that. But you started seeing new crowds. And the, the internet changed for really, prior to the internet, for me, there was no paintings for painting, painting to paint. I liked painting to paint, but everything I painted was to play a game, because for that was what we did. We painted to play the game. But I would go off and do my painting for painting, and I never knew anybody that did that. And then as we started seeing with the internet, these started connecting through AOL had chat rooms or something. I mean, just, and all of a sudden you were running across people that were, they also painted to and that helped. But the sculptors were right. also part of that. And that community started to evolve and develop 
Um, a lot of the ones we still use, though, came out there, like Bobby Jackson. He just showed up at an Origins. He's a kid. Actually, Jack Van Shake, the one I was talking about earlier from Rafa, came over and says, I sent this kid over to you, <clears throat> and he and his wife are here, and he's got this figure. He's going to show it to you. But before you see it, I want you to know it's the second figure he's ever sculpted in his life. I go, okay. You know, I mean, I've seen <laughs> whatever. We'll see. I was blown away. I was just like, you're kidding me. So anyway, yeah, you know, get him going. So we've been with Bobby ever since. Uh, people like Gene came along because of the internet. I think Gene did send some stuff to Ron or was recommended by somebody. So you, you had that. It's a tight community. Nowadays, we just get a lot of solicitations. And Ron goes through them. And if you find somebody that works and, and it works well uh, and can work within the system, uh, yeah, we, we were all over. And the biggest difference is, is we really are more of a, a commercial art house here. Uh, you know, we're not interested in just one figure from you, I mean, even if it's a great figure. You know, if we're going to build a relationship, we need more than one figure. It's got to be done this. You've got to make your due dates. You know, and we're real liberal about those due dates, but you still got to make them. We've had pieces we've waited on for years, so long, that, that actually there was one artist that passed away that his, oh. his wife was cleaning the stuff out and found this box and sent me these pieces that were uh, uh, three quarters almost finished. Was it from a job from ten years before? Oh my you know, just that kind yeah. of. Uh, so at some point you've assigned jobs and you just give up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to get something else is in the way. It doesn't doesn't really matter. But you see a lot of that, and uh, uh, and no, and I'm not sliding. But there's always joke. I said, well, that's why an artist is an artist. Their their world is not deadlines and nine to five. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, but yeah, nowadays it's going to be like that. We go out and we look a lot. Uh, nowadays it's a lot easier you know you get on Facebook you got all these artists that are doing Patreon stuff like that you just got to email them and ask them what they're you know how it works for them what are they into will they do this you've got some studios popping up we've dealt with some studios in Europe where want, you're dealing with one guy and then you oh you want werewolves well this is the guy I use for werewolves and he'll go get right. that for us and stuff like that and uh, uh, but you, you see a lot of that so nowadays that's really the internet's now taken over for that side of it so and one of the things that always comes up when I talk to uh, Michael Proctor or to Jason Levy, kind of that, that is the the family feel that Reaper has to it. I'm just mm -hmm. curious as how you guys fostered it because anytime I talk to anybody, and I've had a chance to talk about with Aaron Hartman and Tish Waller and uh -huh. you know all, all these artists and people that are associated with Reaper, and it's just kind of this I don't know love affair with the company. Just the company. You guys <laughs> just to, I'm just impressed and I like I see it happening in other companies where it's oh I'm leaving that at the place. You know, like right, yeah, you know, like yeah. and no everybody wants to be you know, they yeah. want to be a part of the Reaper family and they're proud when they see their name on a sculpt or a paint and when they paint a piece. I really think it's just a personality of the people that we started with that are there. We've always just been I'm I'm a very easy person to get along with, okay, first off. And I'll help to my fault, anybody, anywhere, anytime kind of thing. And I think that makes a big difference. But I've also worked out with things like that. I go to artists and I go, okay, this is good. It's not one of those, I'm going to make you famous, kid, or something like that. But I will, <laughs> I will promote you. I'll do what I can inside of my sandbox to help you get your sandbox farther along. And then also, we've been, always been really good about customer service, things like that. Um, we've always invited everybody in openly. You know, one of the things that was very frustrating when I was started, starting out was... Uh, I'd love to have gone and just seen Ralph Parthas. Not that I'm there to steal secrets or anything. I don't know if they had a secret to steal. I eventually did take the tour and found out they didn't have any secrets to steal. But, but nonetheless, yeah. Uh, but, but, but nonetheless, uh, that was sort of what it was like. And, and then we just kept going. And then the the and we also hired people that had to fit in with us. We were not really. I always called it like this, like some '70s show where the bus is going down the road. Okay, and then it stops and it picks this person up, and that's the episode of that week. And at the end of that episode, if they found this place on the bus, they kept riding. And if they didn't, well, they got off off the bus, and we got somebody else on. And it was sort of that kind of uh, a light-hearted kind of yeah, approach. During interviews or something with a potential employee, I would sit there and say this is a very zero BS place. Yeah, it's, it's the internet, and that they're they they they're detail oriented. So if you try and BS your way around with these employees. They'll find it out, and then your name is mud. So yeah. Don't even. <laughs> don't even try. I mean, we had some guy that was working in casting that was supposed to be a door gunner for an Apache, which something doesn't even, doesn't have, even a door have a door gunner. gunner and, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah but and those he are, told them that, and, and that he was in Desert Storm. Well, I knew his age. They didn't know his age, and I'm like, 
Well, you'd have been 12 years old. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, you, yeah, it's tough you see, yeah. And so those people just don't last on the bus and go. And mm -hmm. uh, But it is, it's, it's, a, it's a really chill place, but it's a... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say it would be PC place. It's not really that. Yeah. It's like we had an, an artist, a guy that was really he got mad and uh, frustrated, or I don't really know what was getting with him. But he, I came in and we did some uh, totally nude figures. Now nothing was uh, uh, sex oriented. They were just pinup, like pinup kind mm -hmm. of stuff. We did for a while, and uh, and there's a new release of one. And he said, I'm not going to cast this. This means what he goes, and so he t and I get the phone call. He's not even telling me. And so when I get here, I go back there, and, and I said, so what's the deal? And he starts to tell me, I said, tell you what, okay, I got the gist of this. Did you see the logo on the door? It goes downhill from there. Right. So, <laughs> you know, just, just, and, and give just. Give me a badge. Give me a badge. Right. Just yeah. save the whole of the drama. I got the point, and, uh, and, and we just go, you know. But, right. uh, but I think that's just a really, just the culture we've got here. We have very, everybody's really long-term. You know, <clears throat> Ron was the last partner to come on board, and that would have been in 90. Three, three, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, it's also a matter of just treating treating everybody like you want to be treated. I yeah, don't care what your politics, what your beliefs are, or whatever. Just treat you like anybody else. I want to work, and I want to work in a safe place. I don't want to work in a place with skull and crossbones on stuff. So we've always stayed away from anything, mm -hmm. you know, that any kind of process. We're not here just to say, oh, well, we're going to turn another dollar or save ten cents on that. And we just clean it. We just stay away from that stuff. There's a lot of stuff we could do <coughs> if we relax that policy. But we do that, so we always are safe. We take care of each other, you know. And also, too, the work ethic around here is: is everybody gets in and does everything. I'm out unloading containers, mm -hmm. you know. I'm casting if I need to be. I mean, it doesn't really matter. And everybody is. Sadie there in the paint department. She's out unloading containers, yeah. you know. I mean, it doesn't. We and all do our stuff. Yeah. And, and I was nice. the first caster, so literally when something yeah. happens, like one time. We had to let some guy go. Well, he had friends in casting, so uh, uh, overnight we were out of casters. Oh, yeah. So <coughs> yeah, well, one of those. I know yeah. where I'm going, so I just head back there and casting. grab some. Okay, here, yeah. start teaching this person how to cast and rebuild casting. Yeah. Here. So that's yeah, nice. but that's part of it, and then and I think part of it is just the open door policy we've always had. We've never been uh, uh, close. We didn't. I mean, we taught our procedures, our policies and procedures on how to produce stuff to a lot. We said, you know, to Steve Jackson when he went into figures. A lot of these places, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, kind of a thing. And it was, we had an employee that was work, had a good friend at another company. And so he took all these photos and just basically like espionaged all this information there. And I found out about it later. I said, you guys could just call, come down here. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what we did. Time. And this, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and Al, our first partner, he didn't like, he wasn't real big on that. He, he didn't like that, but we still sort of persisted and, you know, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. But that was, I think that's part of what helped breed that whole culture is is if you're doing a good job you get it you're you're we're on top of you you're there it goes and we and there's no politics there's very little the politics and all that kind of jokes it's really not tolerated you know drama mm -hmm. we just keep that just out the door you know and uh so that i mean, i think that's what sort of sets the stage sets at least the stage for, that for that for that kind of evolution so that's awesome i have two last questions yeah. if you don't mind like since yeah. you're both here so you own a miniature company uh -huh. is there something that hasn't been done in a miniature form yet that you'd like to see. I always use the example of Stephen King's Dark Tower characters. I would love to see oh, something like, like miniatures that. like that made. Is there something that you guys would like to see done or would like Reaper to do? It's it's through the years. There's there's a joke. This is a joke, but I mean it's it's not a joke. It's reality for a long time. Is I always wanted a Cerberus figure, and he had to be like this, and we would get, mm -hmm. and I just had this image in my head, and I would show Ron Art. And he finally got it done in the last bones, and that's or this I guess his last bones. Yeah, and Greek he's Odyssey, got that. Yeah. yeah, and he's down there in the Greek Odyssey, <clears throat> and I finally got that. I mean, and that's good, and that's about it. But past that, I mean, through the years we've gotten to Napoleon. We we at one time we were going to go into do colonials, so we did a lot of uh, Zulu warriors and a lot mm -hmm. of the colonials, and I really enjoyed that. Um, we did. We were spinning up a game called Reich of the Dead, uh, which is why we have the, the the remnants of the German stuff and all that junk around here. And uh, that stopped. That was a project that got dead because I ended up in the middle of uh, getting divorced. And by the time that I was over with, I just ran out of time. I ran out of time. I had other stuff I had to do. That project had to be shelved. It's never been resurrected. But I'd like to get back to some stuff like that and mm -hmm. just finish up because they're just sort of the fun, you know. So I get some history out of it and I can mix and mash it together and and do something with it. And that's for about it. Nowadays, it's uh, uh, making miniatures of uh, well, the, the artists do stuff. Like there's a picture. There's a miniature in there. Go get your car cut with you on it. Go do that. But like, um, 
because you saw on the tour we do the cars right and that front car that's that old z28 there's this uh, uh gene van horn did this sculpt because dave's got his puppies he's he's got four dogs you know mm-hmm. he just he lives with his puppies nice. and so it's he and his four cars and one of those old uh i can't think of the guy that did a t- rat tunes or whatever it was called yeah. cartoons, uh, cartoons back in the day <laughs> and so that would be nowadays and this is really facilitated because of 3D printing you wow. know and uh, so what, and so describe it. how would you call those cartoons or whatever yeah. they call yeah. but to the car smoking out and it's yeah. sort of a cartoon look and there's Dave's this big person sitting out the top of the shifter and surrounded by his puppies and you know stuff like that so is it okay if I take a picture of yeah. and post it when I post yeah. the show oh awesome. yeah well, generally, right. though, the, uh, in my world, it's it's generally uh, somebody will come up with something like your your son Jeremy came right. up with. You guys ought to do a, a campsite, you know. And it's like, yeah, no one does a campsite, and and yeah. you know, what do you have? You're out in the wilderness, and your party needs to rest to get the spells back. What do you do? You set up camp, mm-hmm. right? So it's it's kind of like those kind of inputs that you go. We should do that. Now, there's some fun ones there on the flip side of that, though, is which I've always enjoyed. Here's this old story from IPM day, IPMS days. And, oh, my God, I can't think of Doug Horn's friend. Uh, Shep Payne, okay? Um, he was in through the 70s, in the 80s. He was the man. Every model that was made, box, he wrote all these books, all this kind of stuff, and everything else. Anyway, there was a show. Or he was a magazine article. And in it, you have these Germans jumping out of a half-track in World War II. And he has suspended one... German who's jumped over the side and his gears sort of up and he's flying and he's held on by just his hand. That's what glued to the side of the truck. But you know the whole figure's in the air and this that. And so you go to the next show, the next IPMS show, and pow, ever half the models here have something jumping out of them somewhere, mm-hmm. you know. And so when you see when we've done when we do something and then I go to a show and then half the models now have an X or a Y. That that gets cool. That's that fun. is awesome. Yeah, You're setting the trend for sure. So you're sort of setting the trend, yeah. So, <clears throat> but anyway, the, the last question that I always ask my guests, and um, our the motto of the podcast is better, braver, happier painters. And just if there's any advice that you'd like to give people on their hobby journey, that just would help them. jump. The thing I see the most is people saying I can't do that, or they don't want to think outside the box. They just you know, it is a good example. When I was in there in the break room painting these boats for that zombie, the game they're playing up there, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Collins, Michael Collins, the guy running the game, he was there at the table with me, and we're just going along. And I need something to thin a brush, or I need, you know, in my water, it's whatever, and it needed to be clean. That was it. So I had a diet sprites in there. So I just poured some diet sprite literally on the table, and then put my paint to the side, and I pulled it over, and I started doing that. And he's like, "What are you doing?" I said, well, I need to thin it. He goes, the water's right there. You know, the sink is literally right there. Yeah, it is, but I'm here, and I'm trying to get this done, okay? And so the Sprite's working. So finally, though, he does get up, and he comes over back with a cup of water. He goes, there's your water. He goes, I don't know what's irritating me worse, the fact that you wouldn't get up and go get the water or the fact that using the diet Sprite worked, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, so you just you don't know, Perfect. and you just go. It's like when I was painting the bone at the very end. I already had red on the table. So I threw some black down, and I threw some white into it, and it's some metallic, and I said, this is what we're going to pay the Grim Reaper with. So I just mixed it all up, so a little bit, and you just, just go. Just this, have fun. Yeah, in this day and age, though, there's really no reason why you can't do, it's always the intimidation factor of that, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that good, and you'd be amazed, especially now with the internet. And being able to the, learn all the, these things. The yeah. and all that sort of stuff, it's like there's no reason you cannot become a good painter yeah. if you just keep... Keep and there are stuff. recipes. You have to learn your fundamentals. It's yeah. like learning to play guitar. You got to learn chords or whatever. Yeah, right. You know, so flesh works this way. How to do eyes. You know, you can learn these techniques, but don't 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 become a technique painter. If you look at Proctor stuff, man, there's not a whole lot of technique there. There is, but Proctor really gets in there and he woos the light. He does, you know, mm-hmm. and that's really the thing to get people down the road. It's just never tell yourself can't do. It. I always tell everything, everybody, and, and people are in here for their styles and types. I'd rather try and fail than not try and succeed. And that's literally for, for everything. Uh, my wife's boss, uh, she, and she works out at American, and she brought her boss and her, her supervisors out because they wanted to know, they would heard about Reaper, what your husband does, and so I gave them a tour. <laughs> yeah. right? And so then at the end of the tour, I gave each one of them a learn to paint kit, and I said, this is like a drug deal. The first hit's free. After that, you got to buy it. I've got to buy it. The manager got into it. None of them else, they painted it, and it was like, okay, that was fun. But the manager got into it, and now she... 
She watches the videos. She watches the show. She goes. She paints. She posts to Facebook. Yeah, puts it on Facebook. She that's and she's brilliant. really become very, very good at it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, I appreciate you. You're in the middle of a convention, and you took the time out to talk. To no, me. absolutely. I can't tell no you problem. how much I appreciate it. <coughs> okay. And, uh, we'll we'll definitely hype all the Reaper links in the show notes when we release. Dan and I would like to thank Ed and Dave from Reaper Miniatures for joining us today. Uh, what a fantastic interview. We had a lot of fun having the conversation about uh, miniature painting and uh, miniature production. I mean, there's so much information, uh, even at the tour level. It's really, uh, it was a, it was an awesome experience. Uh, Reaper is all over the place on social media and on the internet. Uh, please check out the show notes for the uh, for the links. They have a Twitch channel where they have a ton of streaming, co free streaming content uh, for you to learn how to paint, learn about the company and upcoming things. Also, ReaperMiniatures.com. Uh, they are also on Twitter at Reaper Minis and on uh, Instagram as well. But we'll put all the links to that in the show notes for you. Uh, so again, Ed and Dave, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, we really, truly appreciate it. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube at Listening to Paint Dry, as well as Twitter at Dry Listening. Uh, drop us an email at Listening to Paint Dry at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, any comments, concerns, questions you have about the show or things that you're working on, we would love to see. Like, subscribe, or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could drop us a good review, that would be awesome for the podcast. We'd really appreciate it. We'll be back again very shortly with more content. Plus, not only that, we have a wonderful interview that we recorded before uh, ReaperCon with Lila Mev, the Mini Witch, and that'll be out shortly as well. So if you're looking to become a better, braver, and happier painter, there is no try, there is just do. Do it, you can become one. Until next time. Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan is a production of LTPDWMD. All rights reserved. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the host. The music is Death by a Thousand Questions by Springtide. Download from the free music archive on a non-commercial attribution share alike basis. All views and opinions expressed in the show are solely the views and opinions of the person who said them. All celebrity voices, if any, were impersonated and done so poorly.